Thanks so much for coming, everyone, and welcome. Um, so, um, I'm, I'm going to sort of talk really about hegemony, about the, the reproduction of social power through schooling and the way in which um, hegemonic systems articulate through class, race, and gender, and schooling, um, the, the implicit or hidden curriculum of schooling is to teach class, race, and gender in quite specific ways. So any, any inclusive practice in, in school needs to have a critical perspective on existing hierarchies of power that are always racialized class and gender. So through an example from English, um, English public schooling and some examples from um, Australian debates around gender and schooling, I'm going to look at some of the dominant discourses of um, that are naturalised in school about you know, what school's appropriate role is and who is the appropriate school student is and what is appropriate to regard as boys and girls to learn and how they learn um, and, and look at ways in which existing power structures or hegemonic systems are recreated. Now I'm aware that I'm an enthusiastic speaker. Am I speaking too quickly to people? Can I ask if you put your hand up if I speak too quickly? Just put your hand up and just let me know and I'll slow down. The other thing I would ask is that if there is something that doesn't make sense, so a term or a word, um, if you would ask me, um, and that there is no such thing as a simple question, I would rather clarify what I'm, what I'm speaking on than have you unsure. So, so thinking through hegemony or maintaining the status quo of social power from Anthony Gramsci and Stephen Gogol, uh, a, a very famous Australian theorist, uh, Ray McConnell, talks about hegemonic masculinity, um, a dominant masculinity that rules existing social power. And schools, especially in England, began as places that taught systems of hegemonic masculinity. Schools early on were for boys and girls learning within the home. And the nature of girls learning was very different. It was about um, you'd learn sewing, you'd learn music, you'd learn languages, you'd learn skills that were part of belonging to culture and being a good wife. And the boys' schools taught you to be a citizen and belong to the public sphere. And in many ways, there are still remnants of this very gendered beginning of schooling in the UK school system. So we're going to start off by looking at the production of class and then um, sort of with upper class, the production of upper class masculinity and then um, look at a very famous ethnography, which your libraries have in German and I will read to you some of it and um, I, I encourage you to read it. It's an ethnography of English schools called Learning to Labour, How Working Class Kids Get Working Class Jobs. And it is one of the most significant educational ethnographies I think that has been undertaken. Um, Paul Wheeler. But I'll talk to you more about that as the lecture goes on. And can you see the slide? Okay. Um, so part of what I'm trying to ask you to do here is to also think about your experiences of schooling and the very um, racialized and class nature and, and, and gendered nature of school systems and what you learned, what was valued in the curriculum, how curriculum presented some factors more than more important than others. I'm asking you to start to think critically about existing structures of power in schooling. So you've got your little example from Roald Dahl, um, which you know it's fun. It's a fun example, but it's also making the point, right? It's talking about systems of discipline and punishment used to um, used to, to teach social order. Um, there's a quote from the book where his mother says, I've learnt one thing about England. It's a country where men love to wear uniforms and eccentric clothes. 
you can consider yourself lucky that you don't have to wear a wig on your head and ruffles on your sleeves. So for those of you who have met uh, the work of Pierre Bourdieu, the theorist who talks about the production of, of social class, through, so the ruffles on your sleeves are signifying belonging to a particular social class, yeah? And the kinds of um, the rituals that the prefects or the bozos um, inflicted the junior, on the junior boys are teaching them their place and the hierarchy of masculinity. Um, so, thinking through some, you know, Michelle Foucault has written a lot about the importance of uh, physical discipline on teaching, uh, on teaching people how to fit in to existing social norms. And schools, um, both in terms of the, um, the punishment that the, the prefects were um, enacting on, on the, the younger students that Voldal tells us so vividly about, but also in terms of schooling systems that give you rewards for you know, behaving in certain ways and punish you for not doing what the school is trying to encourage you to do. Schooling systems broadly are shaping a certain kind of subjectivity. And people, people that come from, um, from backgrounds that don't want to acquiesce to fitting in are already at a disadvantage. So the reasons why you might not want to acquiesce or, or fit in are multiple. So it might be uh, it might be that you're used to a different kind of relationship with peers um, and, and elders. Um, so if you are coming from a migrant or a refugee background, you might have a different kind of relationality. Um, or it might be a class distinction where you think that you don't value the kinds of class knowledges that are being taught through schooling. Um, or it might be a range of personal sort of factors that would put the child at risk of not succeeding. So they might be you know, living in a very difficult environment at home, um, living in, um, for example, in high density housing with a single parent, in quite often complex home lives that make it difficult to engage with school. Um, but there are all reasons that might lead students to not conform to the kinds of discipline that are part of fitting into class code. Um, with the reading, do you want me to read some of that? How, how um, do you think I'm long enough to read it? Or I'm not, I'm not sure how to do it. Yeah, yeah. I'll, um, I'll, I'll read out the, the excerpt for those. I'm not sure how fast I'm thinking with reading it, so I'm not sure whether I get to keep enough time. So I'm thinking, so I, if I read it, is that easier? Yeah, okay. Um, at Repton, and I'll show you, so this is, this is a photo from Repton High. And this is, this is Roald Dahl's autobiographical account. At Brexit, prefects were never called prefects. They were called bozers. They had the power of life and death over us junior boys. They could summon us down in our pajamas at night time and scratch us for leaving a football stop on the floor of the changing room when it should have been hung up on a peg. A bozer could scratch us for 101 other pitting little misdemeanors, for burning his coat at tea time, for failing to dust his shabby properly. For failing to get his study fire burning, in spite of spending half an hour in his pocket money on fire lighters, for being late for roll call, for talking in the evening prep, for forgetting to change into your house room at six o'clock, the list is endless. Form the dressing gown off or sleeves it off, the boys would have stayed in the changing room late at night. Others in the dormitory had told you what to answer to this question. Form it off, he mumbled, trembling. This bozo was famous for the speed of his stroke. Most of them paused in between each stroke to prolong the operation. But Williamson, the great footballer, cricketer, and athlete, always delivered his stroke in a series of swift back and forth movements without any pausing between them at all. Four strokes would rain down upon the bottom so fast that it was all over in four seconds. A ritual took place in the dormitory after each beating. 
The victim was required to stand in the middle of the room and lower his pajama trousers so the damage could be inspected. Half a dozen experts who crowd around you express their opinion in highly professional language. What stupid job! What have you got every single one in the same place? Crisis. Could it have had more than one? No, not to get to the next. Oh boy, that Williamson's got a terrific eye. Oh, of course, he's got a terrific eye. Why do you think he's a critic, Emma? There's no way to blood those. If you just had one more, he'd have got some blood out. Good dressing gown, too. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Most voters couldn't get a result like that without a dressing gown. You must have been, you must have tremendously thin skin. Even Williamson couldn't have done that to ordinary skin. Can you use a long one or a short one? Hang on, don't put them up yet. I've got to see what's in it. And so I would stand there, slightly amused by this cool and cynical approach. Once I was still standing in the middle of the dormitory with my scarlet trousers around my knees when Williamson came through the door. What on earth do you think you're doing? He said, knowing exactly well what I was doing. Nothing, I stammered. Nothing at all. Pull those pajamas up and get to bed immediately, he ordered. But I noticed that as he turned around to go out of the door, he craned his head ever so slightly to one side to catch a glimpse of my bare bottom and see his own handiwork. I was certain that I detected a glimmer of pride around the edges of his mouth before he closed the door behind him. The headmaster, while I was at Brexham, struck me as being a rather shoddy, badly legged little fellow with a big bald head and lots of energy, but not much charm. Mind you, I never did know him well because in all those months and years I was at that school, I doubt if he would have ever addressed more than six sentences to me altogether. So perhaps it was wrong of me to form a joke like that. What is so interesting about this headmaster is that he became a famous person later on. At the end of my third year, he was suddenly appointed the Bishop of Chester, and off he went to live in the palace by River Dee. I remember at the time trying to puzzle out how on earth such a person could suddenly reach from being a schoolmaster to becoming a bishop, all in one jump. There were bigger problems to come. From Chester, he was promoted again to be the Bishop of London, and from there, after not at all that many years, he bounced up the ladder once again to the top job of them all, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Not long after that, it was himself who had the power to put a crown in our queen of the Westminster Abbey, with half the world watching him on television. Well, well, well. And this was the man who used to deliver the most vicious beatings to the boys under his care. By now, I'm sure you'll be wondering why I lay so much emphasis on the school beatings in these pages. The answer is that I can't help it. Although all through my school life I was appalled by the fact that the masters and the senior boys were allowed to literally wound other boys and sometimes quite severely. I couldn't get over it. I've never got over it. It would, of course, be unfair to suggest that all the masters were constantly beating the daylight out of all the boys. They weren't. Only a few did so. But that was enough to leave a very lasting impression of horror on me. And it left another more physical impression on me as well. Even today, whenever I have to sit for any length of time on a hard bench or a chair, I begin to feel my heart beating along the old lines that the pain made on my bottom some 55 years ago. There's nothing wrong with a few sharp tickles on the rough. They probably do a naughty boy a lot of good. But this headmaster we're talking about wasn't tickling you when he took out his pain to deliver a flogging. He never flogged me, thank goodness. But I was given vivid descriptions of one of those ceremonies by my very best friend at Rector, whose name is Michael. Michael was ordered to take down his trousers and kneel on the headmaster's sofa, with the top of his body hanging off the end of the sofa. The great man gave one terrific crack, and after that there was a pause. The cane was put down, and the headmaster began filling his pipe from a tin of tobacco. He also started to lecture a kneeling boy about sin and wrongdoing. Soon the cane was picked up again and a second tremendous crack was administered upon the trembling bucket. Despite the pipe filling process um, and the lecture went on for another maybe 30 seconds and then came the third crack of the cane. Then the instrument of torture was put down once again and the box of matches was produced and the matches was struck and applied to the pipe. The pipe failed to light properly. A fourth stroke was delivered with the lecture continuing. 
a slow and fearful process went on until the ten terror destroyed had been delivered. And all the time over the typewriting and the match writing, the lecture on evil and wrongdoing and sinning and misdeeds and malpractice went on and on without stop. It even went on as the strokes were being administered. At the end of it all, a baker and a sponge and a small between town was dismissed by the headmaster, and the victim was told to wash away the blood before he pulled up his trousers. Do you wonder why this man's behaviour used to puzzle me so tremendously? He was an ordinary clergyman at that time, as well as being a headmaster, and I would sit in the dim light of the school chapel and listen to him preaching about the Lamb of God and about mercy and about forgiveness and about all the rest of it, and my young mind would become totally confused. I mean, I would know very well that only the night before the preacher had shown neither forgiveness nor mercy in flogging some small boy who broke the rules. So what was it all about, I used to ask myself? Did they preach one thing and practice another for men of God? And if someone had told me at the time that this flogging clergyman would someday be the Archbishop of Canterbury, I would never have believed it. It was all this, I think, that made me begin to have doubts about religion and even about God. If this person I kept telling myself, was one of God's chosen salesmen on earth, then there must be something very wrong with the whole business. But I think that this story of this approach is tells a bigger picture about the way that schools work. Is that now in the schools won't have corporal punishment as the norm, but they run through discipline. And it's the same um, the same kind of value system and the requirement to acquiesce that the young person is subjected to. And when, so when a student doesn't acquiesce and wants to resist, that is a teachable moment or a pedagogical moment for you. And that is the moment where you ask yourself, what is the student telling me? So what is the resistance about? Is the resistance about class? Is it about race? Is it about gender? Is it about the experience of risk? Is it, is it about a, a, a particular psychological issue in the student's life? Those moments of resistance are asking you to learn and are asking you to question the existing status quo. And you remember that the systems, you know, they're old systems that haven't changed that much. They've been modified in some ways, but they bring with them this, um, this history of violence and of hegemony. So, so Repton High is, you know, is still a school today, and this is the um, this it's now become a co-educational school. And I was wondering if um, if you could give me a few um, descriptive words in English about me. What do you think when you see that in English? Maybe I'll turn the lights off, maybe people can't see. Here we go. Our location has been a seat of learning in communities for more than a thousand years. The 
school was founded in 1557 on the site of an Augustinian, Augustinian priory originating from the 12th century, and the neighbouring church has Saxon origins. This unique pedigree reminds the school both of its enduring moral values that underlie its ethos and of the ways in which its heritage constantly is constantly wrought by adaptation to a new and evolving world. So if we really want to break that down, it means we have old money, we have old traditions, we maintain hegemony with an eye to the global finance market. Isn't it? That's what they're saying is um, constantly brought by adaptation to a new and evolving world is that the kids need to get jobs in China, so we're going to school them for a global workplace, but we come from money and we have we maintain our pedigree. So there are clear messages about class and about the formativity of class being communicated here. And while they may not now be taught through the same kind of discipline that happens in the school that we've heard about from Moldau, they are taught through other means, right? And it's just, it's just as clear. Um, and so what would it be like to be a Gretchen High, you know, if your parents weren't middle class? If, if someone had given you a scholarship to go to the school and you didn't fit in? If you didn't want to tell someone where you went home, um, you know, on, on your time off to go home, you just do a saying to say where your parents live. How would you cope? What would you do? How would you want to not fit in? So they're the kind of things that I want you to be open to asking in educational um, spaces. So, so now we're going to look at the other end, the other end of English education and look at um, Paul Willis. So Paul Willis is one of the founders of cultural studies. So in the 1970s, he worked particularly um, in education, but was part of the Birmingham Centre for Cultural Studies that had an investment in social justice. And cultural studies come from a social justice perspective. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, so, a cultural study perspective that is interested in systems of value. So, um, so the subtitle is How Working Class Kids Get Working Class Jobs. And this is one of the most famous quotes from this book. Um, the difficult thing to explain about how middle class kids get middle class jobs is why I would let them. The difficult thing to explain about how working class kids get working class jobs is why they let themselves. So this, um, we have a very rich ethnographic data that shows you the position that these working class boys have to school as a system. Um, they pit themselves in opposition to both educational institutions and the teachers. The teachers symbolise the middle class symbolise a value system that they feel they belong to and, um, and they have sort of a way, they have a, a disposition or a way of performing their student subjectivity that makes the point very clear that they don't agree with you to what school is all about. And I'm going to read you just a little bit from the book. And I can't encourage you enough to have a look at it. I think it just in terms of the history of scholarship is a very famous piece. So this is just from, um, from the introductory part where Willis is trying to characterise the disposition of these lads that are, that are very critical of school. As the lads enter the classroom or the assembly, there are conspiratorial nods to each other saying, come sit here with us for a lap. Sidelong laughs to check where the teacher is and smirking smiles. Frozen for a moment by a direct command or look. Seeming movement easily resumed with kids moving about the room. I'm just passing through, sir! Sort of looks closer to their mates. Stopping again, they're always ready to meet you. Oh, I've got to take off my coat, sir! So-and-so so -so told me to see him, sir! After assembly started, the kids still marooned away from his mates, crawled back along the stairs behind the curtain and down the side of the hall. Six of the other kids were trying to dismantle a chair with somebody on it as he passes. He's trying to have a laugh. The lads specialise in a 
need to do better. We always stop just short of outright confrontation. Second in class, as near to a group as they can manage, there's a continuous scraping of chairs, a bad tempered tucking at the speaker's request, and a continuous fidgeting about um, fidgeting about which explores every permutation of sitting or lying on a chair. During private study time, some openly show disdain by apparently going to sleep with their head sideways down on the desk. Some of them have their backs to the desk, they're gazing out the window, or vacantly looking at the wall. There's an air of aimless insubordination, ready with a spurious justification that's impossible to nail down. If someone's sitting on the radiator, it's because their trousers are wet in the rain. If someone's drifting across the classroom, he's just going to get a paper for some written work. Or if someone's leaving class, he's going to enter the rubbish bin like a news reader. Comics, newspapers, and news under half usage jet melt away into a loose textbook. The continuous hum of talk flows around in junctions not to talk, like the edge of tide over a barely drained sand. Everywhere there are rolled back eyeballs and exaggerated mouthings of conspiratorial secrets. So he's trying to explain the way that these boys refuse to learn at every moment and, and hide, you know, hide the looking at, you know, naked pictures and stuff. So I think that rich, that very rich description is a great example of ethnography. And became famous, you have talked about the Arkant moment of ethnography where you recognise something that you know. Like, you know when someone expresses something and really puts the nail, hits the nail on the head and you think, yeah, that comes from, you have talked about the aha moment of ethnography. So, so part of the school system is that it's, it's only, it is exclusive in the extent, to the extent that there are some class backgrounds that don't want to engage with school. And you need to realise that that, especially in England, is is a, that's a difficult and hard to change problem, and it's part. It's something that needs to be addressed. Um, there's there's a new version. There's a new collection that's looking at Paul Willis's work from Learning to Labour in contemporary deindustrialised context. So the the ethnography was undertaken in what he calls Hammertown, which was a deindustrializing town, that um, you know, the, the boys or the lads in his ethnography were the children of um, industrial steel workers. And, um, and so the new collection, Learning to Labour in New Times, is, um, is drawing on contemporary examples of deindustrializing places and the problems that kids are having engaging with education um, in these places still. So a lot of the sort of core arguments that Willis is advancing are just as pertinent now. Um, so, yeah, so the school where he undertakes the ethnography is a working class school, but it's the best school for working class kids. Um, and the, the group that he particularly focuses on call themselves the lads, and they are very much the the white English working class boys and they distinguish themselves as such against the other demographics. So this work has been criticised by Angela McRobbie um, at, from the Birmingham Centre for Cultural Studies at the time for focusing, for not intervening in the very sexist ways in which the young men characterise women and the objectification of women in the young men's discourse. Willis tells the boys' story as the boys see it not from a critical ethnographical perspective. So they are essentially very sexist young men um, and they also have a very strong investment in their class position and in recreating that class position. Um, the lad's experience of school is not one of just of truancy, but of seeking to maintain um, personal mobility. Willis says, being free out of class, being in class and doing no work, being in the wrong class, roaming the corridors looking for excitement, being asleep in private, they were all part of what happened at school. These kids had quite complex systems of what you do at school. And that's what, the bit that I read earlier, you know, when they were sitting on the, sitting on the heater or going out of, out of class or taking their coat off, they were, they were mucking around the whole time. 
they always had these systems of deferring responsibility and of not learning. And so, again, we have a teachable moment. Again, we have a moment where the child is asking you, is telling you stuff non-verbally, but is saying, I don't believe in the, the, the way of, of breaking up space and breaking up time that your curriculum delivery is asking me, I want control here. And, and it's about negotiating ways with the young people of them uh, of having a system that they will participate in rather than um, obfuscate at every moment. Um, so, yeah, so the, the students, so I've, I've suggested that there have been some critiques of Willis's lack of engagement with the students' perspectives. Um, and these are both, so Angela McRobbie's work, her early work on girls and subcultures is amazing. And she's there talking about, I mean, these lads take, own both their school space and a lot of public space. They are, um, they're on the streets, they have a sense of being a collective, and they want to write their identity into both the school and the deindustrialising urban landscape. Whereas the girls, are much less likely to be out and about and their culture is much more about being at home and have, um, Angela McRobbie's written quite a lot about girls' bedrooms and, and, and sort of bedroom parties and dancing to record and stuff at home in more feminised and um, arguably safer places. So I think we need to look at the Willis story as also you know, being problematic in the fact that he could have he could have troubled some of the racialized and um, heterosexual and sexist pedagogies of these young men's lives rather than simply reproducing them. But he does tell us them so vividly. Um, so a contemporary example um, is from a film called This Is England, which shows us beautifully a lot of exist um, sort of a vignette of existing subcultures in Britain, and then I'll give you some examples from Australia, for working class young men and the kinds of debates that happen around race and class and gender, and the way in which these are dominant discourses um, in these young men's lives that I would argue uh, are what a lot of working class young men in Britain are learning when they are going to school. Um, they are arguably learning this instead of the school curriculum. So the big picture questions, the kind of, the, the hegemonic questions around gender, class, social belonging, that's what kids are working out in secondary school and what they're trying to negotiate in, um, in developing their identity as teenagers. Um, can you hear me okay? Am I speaking too quickly? No, I um, So this, yeah, this film, has anyone seen, has anyone seen this in England? And I've realised that my, my image has sort of shifted to the side a bit. We can't really get rid of it though, can we? Um, um, it's just, it's just slipped. Think. Yeah, it's just slipped. Yeah, okay. So anyway, I'm going to show you two excerpts from This Is England. And one is just the trailer of the beginning, but one is a... Um, a scene from a shop with the boys in the shop. And these are the questions that I want you to think about while I'm showing, I'll, I'll bring it up again. So I want you, while I'm showing you, to think of some particular questions and I'll show you um, what they are. And you must excuse me while I um, make the um, AV work. So the, the film um, was made in 2006 um, and it's set in England in the 80s. So England in the 80s was you know, the rise of Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher the, and the, the beginning really of austerity. So um, a lot, I think a lot of what's happening now in Britain was set in motion by Thatcher. Um, and so you can see the... Um, 
the kind of the stripping down of social welfare and any values of the welfare state and the, the ways in which these young men who were very under-resourced, both um, in terms of financial capital, but also any kind of cultural capital or educational capital, they're struggling to reconcile um, the, the demise of the welfare state and uh, the, the lack of resources provided for building a multicultural society or infrastructure. So let's just show you the question. The, I need to tell you that um, that the, the protagonist is um, a boy called Sean, and Sean's father died in the war, um, and so he's part of a discourse that runs through debates about schooling and specifically about schooling and social inclusion that pertain to. Um, a lack of sort of male role models for young men. And um, there's a lot of, and I'll go on to some examples from Australia that are about the fact that school, you know, schools need to provide good, good male role models and, and teach um, you know, young people how to perform their gender subjectivities in ways that fit in. Um, so, so Shane is a single, um, has a single mother and he's, um, is finding it hard to make friends at school. He's um, he, and he's just becoming friends with a gang of skinheads. So the questions that I wanted you to ask were after were um, thinking about dominant discourses of race, class, gender, and nation. And so maybe you can just make a couple of notes, and we'll have a little bit of um, feedback after the after the viewing. Thank you. 
said it made one stay. Well, I lie. I'll work them out and out, Miss Hart. It's the people who think we owe them a living that need to go back. Sorry, I should say, I meant to say at the start, um, it is a constant warning for violence. And um, so, I'm sorry that I, I've got to say that. Sorry, the lecture. But, um, and, and, and for those who come to the workshop for the next few days, the media, the media examples do often contain uh, violence. So do, do feel free to, to go if, 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 if you're disturbed by, by violence. Um, so this is a shot thing. So he was typing tacky fuck on the wall. We get a, an, enough of an idea about the, the, the sort of social power structures that are embedded in, in the friendships there. Um, any thoughts on the kinds of the kinds of what constitutes masculinity for these young men?
Yeah, that's really interesting. So the violence, the performance of violence, but also the idea of what's there, that, that sense of entitlement that is thought about as being, you know, the masculine quality, um, public space as a masculine quality, um, the state as a masculine quality, they clearly have a sense of quality there. Yeah. So, so there's boys learning to be boys, and um, and so this is this is Margaret Thatcher. Um, oh yeah, sorry. Um, Margaret Thatcher. Um, a great a great quote from Margaret Thatcher on um. She said. I think we've gone through a period where too many children and people have been given to understand that I have a problem and it's the government's job to cope with it. Or, I have a problem, I will go and get a grant to cope with it. I'm homeless and the government must house me. So they're casting their problems on society. And who is society? There is no such thing. There are individual men and women and there are families and no government can do anything except through people and people look to themselves first. So that is a verbatim quote from Margaret Thatcher. What is society? There is no such thing. So thinking about you know, the reading on austerity and um, the reduction of the welfare state and the ways in which young people are, are, are struggling to cope with austerity measures, you can see this idea of who is society? There is no such thing being performed in increasingly more complicated ways in Britain. Um, and squeeze on schooling as a result. So I guess part of what I'm trying to 
explained looking at the different codes of performing gender, class, and race that are taught during the schooling years are that this is this is the hidden curriculum of school for um, for young people, and it's what a lot of um, what a lot of students are negotiating in different ways. And when that intersects with curriculum, the same issues remain powerful. So, um, so I want I had another example from Australia that I won't show now. I'll go back to if I have time. Um, from a film called Romper Stomper. Have you seen Romper Stomper? I've got one, I'll show another example later if I have time, but I wanted to give some examples on the way in which curriculum is often gendered. And I wanted to look to Australia for some of these examples. Um, so I'm using, I'm going to use an example um, from the former leader of the opposition in Australia, a man called Mark Latham, who's pictured there um, with an Aboriginal Australian leader. And there's Mark in his private school uniform, being a private school boy. Um, but Mark Latham sort of came out in strong support of um, boys needing role models um, and, and sort of said that, that, there's a, that there's a lack of male teachers and a lack of um, sort of masculinity and opportunities to learn how to be a real man in schools. And there, are, I'll give Mark the links to some articles that have, were published in the paper at the time about um, you know, a crisis in masculinity in schools because there aren't enough um, male role models as teachers and that, that schools are um, effeminising boys. Um, and that this sort of produced a moral panic at the time, which sort of reared its head again and again. Yes? And it also draws on, um, uh, what I find really interesting about it is that it's a recurring crisis discourse, the crisis of masculinity discourse is heard regularly. Like, you see it um, rear its head in, in so many different situations. So I've seen it, like, I see it in schooling, no, in, at the, there'd be at least one media article a year, but often there will be a big debate. Well, this is a particular national school or there will be a big debate about boys in school. But there are always um, different versions of the masculinity in crisis um, sort of story that really comes from um, the men's movement in the late 70s, sort of in the mid 80s. Um, and Steve, uh, there's a man in Australia called Steve Goddard who's written a lot about it, but the men's movement was pioneered um, by two Americans that used to run these kind of get back to your essential of masculinity camps. And, um, and they used to go to drumming workshops, drumming and mud workshops. And the idea was that capitalism had emasculated men by taking them away from the family and away from the, um, the fathering role on a day-to-day -day basis and making them work not with their hands anymore but work ab in an abstract sense and therefore the capitalist system was, was taking away the ethics of masculinity and boys were unlikely to learn how to be true men from absent fathers who were off doing feminized soft work. Um, and John Bly, the guy's name is, um, B-L-Y, and he really led this men's movement. And also there's loads of like written books, and there are a million YouTube videos about him telling the story of reclaiming his true masculinity. The men's movement, a la John Dwight, lives on from today. It believes, and it's a centralist idea of, of what's needed to be a good man. And there are many popular cultural texts that draw on such kind of constructive truths. I often use Fight Club. Did you see Fight Club before? And there's a story of, um, it's a story of a man who's deeply emasculated by his um, office job to the point where he's thinking about collecting his office furniture and um, he's doing all these very feminised activities and he kind of splits and develops his hyper-masculine alter ego to save himself. And, um, and it's, it, it's a classic story of masculinity. So, so I, I want to sort of suggest that this incredibly problematic sort of tale of the man in crisis is repeat in, in school situations. 
So if you have something else to add, you can pull over to the podium. Oh, no, but you don't know what happens in the end. The Fight Club. No, the main thing that happens in Fight Club, um, I'm not telling you. But there's, there's a big anti capitalist movement in there. Yeah. Um, but for those of you who haven't seen it, they wouldn't know. You would never get it. Um, okay, so Latham says. Where the, the, there's a dearth of male teachers, and that this is a problem, drawing on John Dwight and the idea that men need to learn how to get from men. Um, and, and like, as you can see, this is kind of, there were, there were a range of different critiques of this position, but overall it was taken up and scholarships were provided within Australia for men who wanted to study teaching to try and get more men into the profession and so scholarships or special bursaries so that it was you know more affordable and men men could teach um, and there's been quite a lot written about it um, yeah so there's there are the links we'll put the links on your online learning page and um, and you can read some of the press coverage about a need of of more more men um, as teachers specifically science teachers um, so, so at this time, then the the male theorist Steve Bidolf, who's written quite a lot about um, the need for learning sort of gender patterns, was is coming out in support of Mark Latham, um, saying that men are sort of more suited to learning trades or learning practical work. Um, and that not only is there an issue around not having enough male teachers, but the curriculum has become feminised, that what men are asked to learn um, emasculates them. And I think we can see through the sociology of education um, that, that the way in which different subject areas are constructed remains incredibly gendered. Like, Statistically, more females teach arts and social sciences subjects, more males teach um, hard sciences or, um, or like practical shop subjects or PE. Uh, there are more males in senior management. There are more male secondary school teachers than there are primary school teachers. All of these empirical facts are making very loud statements. There are very, you know, the fact that you're, you're much, I mean, you're not likely to have a male home economics teacher, or, you know, you're not necessarily likely to have a female um, uh, physics teacher, uh, and that those those issues remain um, remain ongoing and problematic. So, Wayne Martino is a Canadian scholar who worked on the sociology of education, specifically kind of problematized the ways in which curriculum areas are gendered and curriculum pathways and subject point choices are gendered in class. So obviously particular class backgrounds might choose a, um, a, a like a practical focus for their outcome and they will be encouraged into doing a practical a practical pathway. In both the UK and in Australia, you have the option to graduate with um, a practical leading certificate that will give you to go on to do apprenticeship and um, you know, a practical trade or learn a trade, or go on and do your A levels or your matriculation and go on to university. And the ways in which those subject pathways are discussed are incredibly class in terms of what kinds of aspirations are seen as appropriate or realisable, um, and they're also incredibly gendered. So, um, so Wayne Martino, I think, very rightly makes this point that, um, that addressing the status of teaching as a profession requires the interrogation of the very system or culture of masculinity that leads to the denigration and the devaluation of so-called women's work. And I think in terms of belonging to school cultures and, um, and, and, and making school cultures, it's interesting to ask yourself who does what jobs in schools. 
and who does what jobs in you know, the administration, the functioning of the school? In what ways is labour consistently gendered? In what ways are you know, different curriculums gendered? And because that's all part of what you're teaching the kids. Um, and I think that's, that's something that only we can change. Um, so from Australia, this is, um, this was used, I think, as part of the um, campaign to try and impose more in teaching. Um, 25 to 7 male teachers in America, and then, uh, sorry, 25 to 7 teachers in men, in Canada at 17%, in the UK at 25%. So, you know, obviously, it's all, um, that, that was sort of part of the broader um, drive to try and increase a gender balance, which I think is, in, you, which is a really problematic concept. I don't agree that, um, that, you know, that you, you learn your gender in such, um, in such simple ways, I think it's much more complicated. And the research kind of tells us that, um, that, that having a good teacher and good connections to um, a pedagogical figure or um, a caring figure, it doesn't matter the gender. It's all about the quality of the connection and the quality of the information um, given over. So, so part, of, part of this debate about the fact that schools are feminising boys um, had a moral panic about boys' lower literacy um, and the, the argument behind it was that um, boys don't learn as well from women, um, which again has of course been problematised but, but I think these ideas come up again and again in different ways um, and the value of, of male teachers as, as role models for male students comes up again and again. Um, the discourse which demanded more, ta more teachers in the context of feminised education was outlined then by Raywin Connell, who I introduced earlier as sort of drawing on the ideas of hegemony in schooling. Um, and she outlines this idea saying, uh, men appreciate the importance of sport, fighting, competition, emotional control and so forth in a way that women cannot. Therefore, the education of boys can only be properly undertaken by men acting as role models, mentors and coaches. So she's being satirical, but trying to suggest that this is what's at the bottom of the kinds of, the kinds of critiques. So, okay, so I disagree fervently with these kind of discourses, but I also think that they are a part of um, the institution of schooling and that they often aren't questioned, that the reproduction of race and gender and class um, consistently happens in, in schools. And I think that the, the way that, that there are things that, that need to be done to change it, that is only to, to question the reproduction of the hegemonic systems, um, to trouble it, to ask, so things like the division of labour um, and how jobs are assigned and what's assumed as being um, the correct pathway for certain students from class backgrounds. Um, to, to listen to teachable moments that students give you around refusing existing systems or trying to trouble status quo and to try and understand where the students are coming from um, are things that I would, I would suggest are the beginnings of inclusive practices. Um, so Wayne Martino here again saying, certain um, teacher traits and skills such as the ability to teach well to engage students through providing a relevant curriculum, to set boundaries in terms of managing classroom behaviour, to establish a friendly and warm approach to the classroom, and to relate to students as people and to explain concepts, have been identified obviously as important things for engaging boys and girls in learning. Um, but I think that more than that, it's about problematising um, existing truths and the, the kind of power that they're given. Um, yeah, so if you're interested, Martina has written a bit more, like, like has written a great amount of work really on men in schools and, um, and the project of developing non-violent masculinities through schooling. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this debate about feminised curriculum, but I'm just going to keep it on the time. Yeah, we're going fine. Um, so... 
So in, in Germany, have, have there been debates around the feminisation of curriculum? At the time when the Mark Latham crisis that I um, sort of gestured to earlier, when, his, when the press coverage of his critique of schools as feminising spaces came out, there was a huge debate in Australia around the fact that um, schools were becoming less focused on rote learning, they were becoming less focused on facts, they were becoming increasingly feminised, and they were developing learning styles that were not right for boys. They had feminised learning styles. And so, um, so here I'm drawing on Gilbert and Gilbert's book, Masculinity Goes to School, um, looking at um, these, these constructions of masculinist epistemological stances um, that suggest there are certain kinds of knowledge that boys learn well that girls don't learn as well, and certain kinds of knowledge that girls learn well that boys don't learn. And that these, Gilbert and Gilbert thoroughly deconstruct these in Masculinity Goes to School, and they're, I think, cultural myths that, again, in Australia we often see, and you may or may not encounter them in your working classrooms, but I think they're things to watch for because I think they're part of the hegemonic system of schooling. So um, the belief in objectivity or ob objective truth without kind of understanding that all objective truths are, are co-constructed. Um, essentialist ideas about gender and about class. So that's about aspiration, about futures, um, and about about sort of what, what appropriate choices for young people are. Um, and the idea that, um, that boys like facts. Um, Connell comments, the usual claim is that boys need a more formal pedagogy with smaller chunks of knowledge and fixed sequences, clear cut definitions of right and wrong. And that in Australia still stands today. So I was on a panel about boys in schools about six months ago with kind of the, the um, leading people in Australia working in boys' schools. And King's School, which as you can imagine is you know, the poshest school in Australia for, um, for young men, the, the principal of King's School gave a speech about um, the learning span of teenage boys and how anything for um, anything longer than five minutes was too much for a teenage boy. They can only learn in five minute chunks. They're all sleep deprived. They're all um, masturbating on their computers late at night, staying awake, not going to sleep. And I thought, I can't believe he's saying this. This is, this is what he said. He, you know, he said that you know, and so they're struggling through this lack of sleep and, and their sexual awakening and they can only learn for five minutes. And anything longer than five minutes at a time isn't appropriate for a boy. I was like, my God. Like, but they're clearly, they're clearly being taught to become a certain kind of person. Imagine someone speaking to you in a way that assumes you couldn't understand anything for longer than five minutes. So they're going to become, like the temporality of their gender is being taught from a very young age and they're going to become a very kind of aggressive, assertive young man that obviously expects things to happen within five minutes. And, um, and he's clearly being encouraged to masturbate on computers late at night. If you, if you saw him with his sticky bow tie and his suit and his big stomach, you would have thought it was very hilarious. But I didn't laugh. I was very professional and gave my talk and didn't mention it. But so these are, these are ideas that still come back in public debate. Um, so, so Connell's work on masculinities and on schooling shows that subject pathways and choices in subjects are incredibly gendered. Um, and that, you know, this is hard to change. It's hard to encourage girls to go into the hard sciences still. And that's partly because of who teaches them, how it's taught, and the expectations for the girls. Um, but I like the way that Connell characterises these choices as historically produced patterns. They are indeed historically produced patterns. So part of the boys in crisis discourse, wherever it arrives, and the Fight Club movie is another great example of it, but there are many examples, is that the girls are at fault. When, when there is a crisis of masculinity, it's because the woman has lost control in some way. Either she's taken up too much space in the school or she doesn't control herself well enough. She hasn't provided the care that was required. She's too sexually demanding. 
There's, there, there is the, out of, the spectre of the out-of-control woman in any crisis debate around masculinity. So, the failing boy at school co-constructs the overly successful girl, um, as Jessica Ringrose so astutely puts it. Um, and I think that that's, that kind of binary is what we need to trouble, is that there is, there is that these populist moral panic discourses have no grounding in, um, in empirical results, but have a lot of social power. And we need to think that, us, that both boys and girls can succeed together without, um, yeah, without, one, without one sort of sacrificing success to the other. So these references are also at the, um, at the end of the lecture. And if you're interested in these kind of debates and the debates about the feminised curriculum, I really encourage you to have a look. And you're also really welcome to send me an email if you want um, to talk a little bit more about it. Um, yeah, so just... Um, I'll start winding up. But the kind of... I guess just in, in, in giving you the big picture points that Connell's making about learning um, sort of patterns of gender and hegemony, the, the things that she's calling our attention to repeatedly are to look at divisions of labour, to look at power relationships and the performance of authority, who holds authority, how is it taught in both conceptual and corporeal senses. Are any, what patterns of emotion are acknowledged? I think that is so interesting. Like think about the, the way in which schooling tries to delegitimise emotions. It's completely impossible. Like we can't, we can't not have emotions. But school curriculum delegitimises emotions consistently. Schoolrooms delegitimise it. They're kids. Like it's, th th that to me seems like one of the most quizzical things that happens. Um, Organisational cultures and policy teach very specific ideas about class and gender. So these are the clues that Connell's giving us about how to read institutional pedagogies. So I thought we could have a bit of a discussion about that. And I thought that they were kind of the core points that I was wanting to give across. I think you're probably ready for a bit of a chat slash, and there are references. Um, but again, you're really, really welcome to, my, my email is on the front of the slide, so you're really welcome to follow up. And we have got kind of 10 minutes to have a chat about these kind of institutional pedagogies, really.